Hey guys, how you doing? Uncle Steph here. So I wanted to address the current resistance I'm seeing with some people when it comes to adopting the new AI paradigm in terms of development. So something that I've been talking about more and more and more now, you should be getting into this, especially, well, everybody should get into this. If you're a junior developer, by the way, and you're looking for an angle to be able to get the junior dev jobs, the more you understand how AI can be integrated with your development processes, the more likely you're going to get a job. Now, the path for beginning developers is, of course, to learn. I always say learn the web stack. It starts HTML5, CSS3. Then you want to learn these two programming languages, JavaScript and Python. Now, Python can be used for the web. But the reason I say JavaScript Python is because they're widely used within the context of AI. Back in the 1990s, when I started writing professional code, I was, um, so first of all, I adopted the new stuff, which was the web. That was the disruptor technology of the time. So I jumped into that because I knew that's where all the demand would be. I knew that because it was so new, because it was growing very quickly, even with very little skill, I could get work and get a job. And that's exactly what happened. Well, I didn't get a job, but, but I got work. I got work. I did projects for different types of companies, all kinds of different freelance work. Anyway, one of the mistakes I made early on, though, is something I think some people might be able to relate to. So what did I do wrong? One of the mistakes I made was to not embrace certain new technologies, productivity technologies that were available at the time. So I was writing commercial Java code. I started learning Java in 95 when it first came out. I think I started writing commercial Java code in 96, 97 or something like that. Anyhow, for the first couple of years that I wrote Java, I refused to work with a code editor or an IDE, not even a code editor. I would use Notepad on Windows and I write my Java code and then I would use Javac and I would manually compile the code, et cetera. And I thought to myself, well, that's, it's cheating to use a code editor because it writes a code for you. It was cheating to use an IDE because it did even more, which is a silly and stupid idea upon reflection. That was what I told myself. And that was part of the reason I didn't learn to use an IDE or a code editor. I just used Notepad. But one of the reasons I didn't do it was due to psychological resistance. I did not like the idea of changing what I was doing. And number two, was, and I have to be honest with myself, I didn't want to learn the new stuff. There was a, a minor barrier to entry to use an IDE or a code editor, especially an IDE. And not a big barrier, a very minor barrier to entry. Right? Very minor. It's like, you know, a couple of days you're up and running. Strange, it's strange, eh? That you know, I would learn the new languages and jump on the whole new paradigm of the web, but when it came to just using a productivity tool like an IDE, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and the brain works in funny ways. If you take anything away from this video, I would say that the biggest impediment people have in all just about all aspects of life is not intellectual, it's not your brain power. The main problem that you have is probably psychological. Psychological resistance and barriers. That's why I keep talking about it, because I can tell you from my career, the biggest challenges I had was dealing with these psychological impediments. It could be simple things not like not wanting to learn something new because I'm in this camp. What you have to do is you have to try to break free of those barriers that are artificially imposed upon you. You want to become open, free thinker. You do that, your chances of success will skyrocket quite a bit. So for example, if you love a particular programming language like JavaScript, and you have uh, no desire to learn Python because it looks very different, right? It doesn't have the curly braces, it has uh, different constructs that you don't see in JavaScript, learn it. Because what you'll find is once you learn JavaScript, you will become a much better, excuse me, once you learn Python, you will become a better JavaScript programmer. That's number one. Number two, 
you also open yourself up to many new opportunities that you might not have explored otherwise. So this becomes especially true in the AI world, right? Those who embrace AI-based development, especially if you go into the agentic stuff, the agent stuff, that's going to open up a plenty of opportunities for you. As I said, back in the 90s, when I was one of the people to early adopters of web tech, the world was my oyster because there was such a demand and the current developers at the time, a lot of them didn't want to move over to the new stack because it was, you know, they had the same psychological resistance. Uh, so that opened up a lot of opportunity for me. Today, you see that with the AI development. Now, I'm not saying that all the coding is going away. It's not. I think it's going to be around for years, in fact. But those who, who jump into the new game learn to enhance and, super and, and, and supercharge their traditional development, plus learning the new agentic stuff. It's just going to be in a very good position. One of the principles I learned a long time ago was that uh, well, in biology, they say the most adaptable species are the most successful species. So humans are very successful because we're very adaptable. Like, you know, a, certain types of whales may be smarter than us, but they don't, they don't have that ability to be adaptable because they don't have hands. Uh, we're very adaptable. And because we're very adaptable as a species, we become the most dominant because we're certainly not the fastest. We may not be the smartest. Uh, we're not the strongest, et cetera, and so forth, you know. Uh, polar bears do much better for us, much better than us in the Arctic, but you know, you get the idea. Same thing in your career. The most adaptable developer will be the most successful developer. The best developers learn to uh, forget about being a loyalist to a particular language or a particular stack, and they move from one to the other. I have done this my entire career. There are several languages and frameworks and uh, entire paradigms of software development that I used to do and made good money with that no longer exist. And I didn't cry and said, oh, boo, I just switched to the new stuff. The good news is once you understand development, moving from one language or one framework or one stack to the next, not a big deal, not a big deal. The most successful AI developers are going to be developers who understand the stacks, right? Now, you may not be writing nearly as much code, that's where the AI, but you're going to be architecting it, positioning things, understanding when it makes sense to, to deploy this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, so get into that, get into that. That said, there's still going to be tons of small business developments with WordPress and Shopify and Drupal and Joomla, where AI is going, to, is going to have a marginal impact for years. There's tons and tons of that legacy stuff out there. So I don't think like you're going to see all this change overnight. It's going to take time because you've got all this legacy content out there, all this legacy infrastructure out there that people are not going to just want to blow away. So again, to conclude, A, don't let psychological uh, barriers slow you down. Try to free yourself of that. The best martial arts are like that as well. That's where MMA came about. Like when the martial arts understood that they couldn't just be strikers or they couldn't just be grapplers. It had to be a combination of their own, of, uh, and became, it became their own thing. They had to have the flexibility. You had to know how to grapple, to take down, take down defense. You know how to do submissions, how to do submission defense. You had to know how to strike, kicking, punching, etc. And of course, everybody's got their specialization, but you had to have more of a well-rounded disposition. Flexibility, flexibility of mind. Even in a particular fighting style, like boxing, the best fighters, the most famous fighters, they're able to change uh, how they are tactically managing a fight as the fight progresses. The, the, the not as accomplished fighters, or those fighters are not as accomplished, are not able to change so easily. So yeah, work on... Uh, changing your disposition, your psychology rather, so that you can accept that learning new things like the AI stuff is not a threat to you. It's actually an opportunity for you. I, in fact, I've said it before. I'm saying it again. I think that this is one of the best times in software developer history if you just embrace the new technology. Very cool stuff. So let go of the psychological limitations. Jump into it. Be free, be free, be mentally, emotionally free. 
of these hangups. And don't be on team A when you should be on team, uh, how am I gonna say this? Don't be locked in a particular team. Be open to everything. 99% of the time, people who go into debates are not going into debates to learn what's true by challenging ideas and figuring out. They're going into debates to try to win. And it's rare that when you go into a debate, somebody will accept that, you know what, this, this my opponent won. But if you can be one of those rare individuals who can accept when your opponent, who has presented to you opposing ideas that basically cut the knees off of your ideas, you should embrace that and go, that's good. You should go into a debate to defend your position, but more importantly, to figure out what is true. Because if you don't accept what is true, you're hurting yourself in the end. That happened to me once. I learned this lesson a long, long time ago. I got into a big debate, big argument, and I won the debate. Not just my opinion, but people around there. And about six months later, I realized that I was wrong. And my opponent had been actually accurate, but he was not as good a debater as me. Uh, I was going to make a joke. But anyway, yeah, he wasn't... Point is, that even though I had won the argument, the debate, I had obfuscated the truth from myself. So in the end, even though I won, I actually lost because I uh, had a chance to learn something that was true, but it was objectively factual. But because of uh, the debate was, because I won the debate, I didn't get the truth until six months later. So go into anything with open eyes. Uh, if you are debating with people, I would suggest debate with the intent of trying to discover what the truth is, not necessarily to win, you know? Although there's an argument for the adversarial process that you see in the court systems that, you know, ideally it leads to truth. Not always the case, though. Hey, I'm Uncle Cinema Steph. I hope you like my new cinema style video here. Just trying to spice it up. If you have any disagreements with anything I discussed today, let me know. Put in the comments below. If you like what I say, let me know in the comments below. If you think my hair is too long, give me a thumbs down. If you think my hair is too short, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> All right, we'll talk soon.